So this is a unique pleasure. This is something we usually do every year, but it's been a couple of years because, for obvious reasons, so we have with us not only the 1L students that we normally have in the LLMs, but LLMs who've been here a semester already and 2Ls have been here. So at the risk of boring some of you with stuff you already know, I'm going to step back and give you a comprehensive review of what I think is one of the most innovative, in-depth, and meaningful law and technology programs. Uh, I used to say on the East Coast, now I'll say in the country, I may say in the world. World. You know, I'm an old marketing guy, this kind of hyperbole stuff takes over, but anyway. Um, whether on a comparative basis it doesn't ultimately really matter, you're here, the point I would make is there's some great opportunities here. Really built around a commitment that there's a lot of programs that I think are entirely student run with no faculty contact, and there's a lot of great programs that are entirely faculty programs in which students really don't participate at all. And I aspire to something better. I think the best programs have that kind of integration that brings together an entire community, where there's opportunities for students and faculty to engage together in a common set of issues about which we're all passionate. And so I think that's a, one of the things that we discovered is that's really happening here at Penn. And I'm going to talk to you some about the institutions, about how that makes it happen. For those of you who are 1Ls, some of them I will tell you up front, you'll hear this to inform you for things that you will not be able to take advantage of until this summer or this coming year. Because not um, mostly uh, there's a lot of restrictions on what uh, under the ABA about what we can ask 1Ls to do and not do. Uh, but by all means, we want to have them on your radar so you know as they come up uh, and you can plan around them because the pity of it is if we make a great program and for some reason you don't get to take advantage of it if you wanted to. So we're going to try to fix it. So the number one thing I'll tell you about uh, briefly is the faculty. Um, we have uh, a, a great law and tech faculty, and we define law and tech very, very broadly. In a lot of places, it's just about intellectual property, but what you'll see here is we have faculty who are interested in healthcare. We have faculty who are interested in smart contracts. We actually have a bunch of affiliated faculty in addition to the core faculty you see here who get involved in the program to do things like fintech. So Tom Baker has organized fintech programs and cyber insurance programs for us. And we continue to do these things. And we reach out across the university to work with Wharton, to work with the Annenberg School, to work with the engineering school to bring these together. For example, uh, one of the things I'll show you in November, one of the things we're making a concerted effort to do is to build ties to the bioethics program and to develop a healthcare curriculum for those who are interested in that. We're co-sponsoring an event with the, the bioethics program on November 15th. And uh, for those of you who are involved in student organizations, by the way, um, our whole goal, by the way, is to, in this is to co-sponsor with a lot of organizations and to work together with you. Uh, one of the things that you'll see uh, we have here is we're going to, at different points, have student representatives talk about the organizations and how they feel. And um, I'll tell you we're collaborating with all of them and are always looking for opportunities to deepen that. Uh, your student organizations are yours as you see fit. Ultimately, it's up to you to decide uh, what student organizations do and don't do, but uh, we are wide open to it. Uh, on the CTIC side. So um, I could go through these all one at a time, but you can go to the center's website and pop them all up. You'll see our core faculty. You'll see the affiliated faculty within the law school. You'll see a number of other affiliated faculty from across the university. I would encourage you at your leisure, because it's not exactly the time to do this kind of thing well. I start to investigate the people who are interested in the things you are. Uh, because I'll tell you, as a faculty member, there's nothing more exciting than having a student who's interested and engaged in, in these sorts of things. And so, uh, and I think kind of one of the great things is the opportunity to develop those kind of relationships. Right? So, <clears throat> roughly speaking, this is, um, we've kind of grown and grown and grown, and I'm not trying to introduce a, a degree of organization. Um, in a way, the, the natural interests of the faculty and the students will take it whatever it wants. But I just realized, we came so strong, this is a conceptual framework if you want to give buckets or like, you know, have branches to hang little Christmas ornaments on to figure out how it goes. And I think of these as these five areas, antitrust, entertainment and media law, health law, intellectual property, and what I call internet and technology law, including privacy. Um, so a lot of them move over. So for example, I'm doing a paper right now on contact tracing under COVID, which is very much in the joints between internet law and health law. And so they're not intended to be hard categories, but on the other hand, it's intended to be evocative. So there's a lot of health law that is directly tied to innovation. So there's a bunch of things such as Hatch-Waxman and Baidol, which are statutes to try to increase investments in, in patenting or change the patenting scheme within the health law space. But then there's a bunch of things such as like healthcare financing, which really aren't about innovation, it's really about delivering services. And so you see that there's sort of different clusters that go around here. A lot of entertainment and media law is deeply imbued in intellectual property. Some of it just isn't. 
You know, I would tell you right now, the biggest change happening in the entire entertainment industry is the move away from cable television to online platforms. This is, IP has something to do with it, but it's really about business models. It's really about contracts and business relationships and uh, many, many other things. And so um, I decided, you know, we're going to try to do this. It's still a bit of a work in progress. And frankly, these things always change. If you, when I started this center 14 years ago, these would not be the topics, you know, and it's going to continue to change, but that's good. That's natural. Um, we offer a really, really robust set of courses. Um, here's just some of them. We can't even fit them all on a slide. I would say that uh, for those of you who are what else, um, there are some, ob you have two electives next semester. There's some obvious opportunities to do them. Introdu introduction to intellectual property law and policy uh, is a, a general elective, and I teach it as a prospective elect uh, uh, regulatory elective called Internet Law, both of which will be open to 1Ls uh, this year. But in addition, what you'll find is many, many of the students in this space will take what we think of as the core IP classes, which are patent law, copyright law, and trademark law at some point in their law, in their law career. But then there's, um, we're teaching privacy in the spring as an upper level elective. Uh, you'll discover we're constantly bumping into antitrust issues, health law, gaming, trade secret, you'll see on and on and on. I think uh, we even have, yes, yeah, there, we have the law and autonomous vehicles is crammed in the bottom, and we don't even have the AI seminar that I'm teaching this semester. So, oh, it is. Yeah. Excellent. So the bottom line, and there's a bunch of other things like administrative law, that, you know, are very natural for you to take. So, I mean, what I would say is, um, you know, I would um, encourage you to talk to people. Actually, the people I encourage you to talk to the most is upper class students because they've been through exactly what you think. And it seems uh, a bit natural to faculty and a bit mysterious to the 1Ls. And by the time you're 2Ls and 3Ls, you got it all on. So I mean, it's uh, all that. And so we actually have, in a way, this all begins with the faculty in the course room, in the classroom. But in addition, we have a number of very, I think, innovative programs, uh, the one of which is a bit of a labor of love for me, which is the Journal of Law and Innovation. Now, the Journal of Law and Innovation is not your normal journal. Um, the Journal of Law and Innovation is taught not is taught as a class. In the fall semester, you do a seminar on a particular topic chosen by the professor who's leading in that semester. It has a conference that leads to uh, an in-person conference that typically happens in January. And you spend the spring semester not so much studying the class, but actually doing editing the volume and moving forward that way. Because you get curricular credit for it, many people find it quite possible to take the class as well as a journal. Uh, Gerald, I believe you're doing that now, aren't you? I am not. You are multiple not. people are. Multiple people are. And uh, in addition, the, because it's done as a class, the uh, process for being part of that journal will happen uh, it, right around spring break. It's not part of the normal journal competition. There are a handful of classes in the school to which you must apply to become part of it, and the journal is one of them. And so uh, for me, the nice thing about it is you can hope there's a part that's the curricular part. Uh, that you can control as, a, as, a, as an instructor. The social part you really are is aspirational, which is you hope it comes to be a, a community building place where people who share the same interests come together and find it to be the case. Um, it's something you can hope for but can't guarantee. And, Marat, and just to my great pleasure, it's been a fantastic, it's exceeded all my expectations in that regard. And obviously, you know, in a, in a, in a law school culture where it's an upper class, world, it, institutional memory is literally one year, you know, because it's the three L's who had an experience as two L's, and then the two L's are coming at it new. It's sort of funny. So it's honestly something that we constantly invest in and reinvent and recreate every year, very successfully, because I think we have a very special group of students. And this journal list here is led by Gerald Adams, third year student here. At Hi, everyone. Yeah, so I'm Gerald. I'm the editor in chief this year for JLI. Uh, as Professor Yu said, it really is a unique experience, right? So, like any other journal, there is an editing component, right, that takes place in the spring for us, um, where we analyze scholarship, you'll do all the blue booking and everything that's expected within a student journal. Uh, what we try to provide, though, is a unique and more engaging experience where through the seminar in the fall, you're really analyzing and discussing scholarship within that particular topic area. Um, often that means working with CTIC faculty. Occasionally it even includes engaging with outside faculty and potential individuals that will be publishing papers in the journal in the spring. Um, and so we feel like that gives you a more thorough understanding of the topic for the year so that when you get to the editing process, it's much more substantive. It's not just editing for the sake of editing. 
you actually engaged in the topic and the idea. So this year we're doing um, innovation in criminal justice, which is a very prevalent topic at the moment, um, and obviously fairly broad uh, and extremely engaging. So the things that we're looking at this year, the dark net, uh, 3D printed guns, ransomware, biases and algorithms and artificial intelligence. Um, that goes all the way from analyzing and policing to evidence that's admitted in court to sentencing guidelines. So it really is um, something that is across the broad array of the criminal justice system, which we think is very important and something that has not been discussed enough. And so we're providing a very uh, more focused analysis of that within the journal this year, and we're excited. Um, I would say for all of the 1Ls, be on the lookout for our symposium that will be in January. I believe the confirmed date is January 28th. So we would love for all of you to be there and participate and be engaged. Um, we're always looking to develop and build the community around JLI. Um, and then on top of that, as Professor Yu noted, uh, you'll have the writing competition in the spring. Uh, and from there, you'll be able to you know, join, join our tribe, join our group, and, and move forward. Um, we're getting very big. Um, even based on last year. So it's a very exciting time to, to participate in the journal. And we look forward to meeting and interacting with all of you. That's great. And we support, there's a certain number of social events in the year, team building, collaboration events, just to create a sense of community. Something Gerald said really triggers a piece of advice I'll give you generically, which is, um, so one of the, um, there's a, my second dean when I was teaching another school was a former Penn professor, his name is Ed Rubin. And he said, one of the weaknesses that you can fall into is you um, everything's taught as a second year class, which is you march through a lot of doctrines. So in some senses, you'll see this for those of you who are one L's and those who've been through it. On some level, when you're laying foundations, uh, not all of you are going to be, say, contracts lawyers when you get through. So in some ways, understanding conceptually what's going on, it allows you to slow down a little bit. And in the middle part, you take a bunch of stuff, you learn a whole lot of law. But in an ideal graduate curriculum, you'll progress to upper level things where you can slow down instead of getting a bunch of more survey classes, which throw a lot more money you know, in your hopper. You think about exploring some issues in greater depth and the things that are, you're interested in. And that's one of the great opportunities of a true graduate program. I think JLI is, is an essential part of getting that experience. And if you want my general advice, I would say start having that as part of your 2L year, not your three, just your 3L year. Because that's where you really start to get the kind of exploration of things that really interest you, including, as was my experience, the this is not what I thought it was, flee in horror opposite direction reaction. <laughs> so I mean, and you, it's something you only get with the experience, but to me, the sooner you engage, if you just took a bunch of other classes you're supposed to take before graduation in the beginning of your second year, you know, corporations and evidence and all these other things, you'll get to the end of your second year no more reflective about what you actually want to do in law than you did going in. So there's an optimal mix, and I would encourage you to think about that, particularly in ways to explore things you want to do. The other really distinctive experience we have, and Daryl, if you would give the microphone to Professor Dahl, is the Detkin Intellectual Property and Technology League Clinic. Yay! And I could talk about it, but why do that when we have the person, the maven, who knows more about it than any other person? Professor okay. Cynthia Dahl. Thank you. Let me get hooked up here. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Cynthia Dahl. Um, I teach the IP clinic, and you may not know this, but we actually have a working law firm in the basement of Silverman Hall, and the IP clinic is one of nine clinics. Um, but talking about community, talking about experiencing, and talking about sort of doing a deep dive into areas that you're interested in, the clinic will allow you to do all of that. Uh, we have a small but mighty a uh, firm of eight students that all work with me on actual client work. And so how is this different from what you would get at TPIC, for example? Well, first of all, you are the first chair lawyer. You're not just doing tasks, although the work that TPIC does is amazing, and I don't mean to, to it's just a whole different model. Um, what we're doing at the clinic is allowing you to own client work and figure out by meeting with them at the beginning of the semester what they need and how to deliver all the things that they need to get to the next step. So uh, talking about um, Professor Yu's buckets, so far the only of the five buckets we have not hit in the clinic is antitrust, but I don't know, maybe <laughs> at some point. Um, it is a transactional clinic, I should tell you, um, and we do operate in patent law, copyright law, trademark, trade secret, and increasingly data and privacy as well. 
the sorts of clients that we handle, um, a lot of early stage entrepreneurs and technologists and inventors, also artists, also nonprofits. So um, I can tailor the list of clients to the interests and the abilities and the needs of the students that come to the clinic. We offer all of our work uh, for free, and so free is good for all of these people that I mentioned, and so we often get 100 applications or so for 12 client spots, and so I'm able to really pick and choose the clients that we work with based on a variety of factors, but especially um, based on to give the students um, holistically across the clinic the uh, pedagogical, um, meet their pedagogical goals as well as their interest and in subject matter goals as well. So um, my clinic is offered by application and so uh, and it is open to second years and third years. Because we're transactional, we are um, guided by the, or limited I guess by the, the ABA uh, rules, uh, by the Pennsylvania Bar rules rather, about um, being in court. So you can take it as a fall semester second year. Although I would say I have to give preference to third years, and so by and large, most of the students in the clinic are third years. But once you apply for the clinic, you uh, get preference for future semesters, and so it's not a bad idea to think about it um, if it is if it fits right into your um, your time at Penn to think about it in second year. The application happens in uh, at October for the uh, spring semester, uh, November October November for the spring semester, and in. July for the fall semester, and just look out for an, uh, an email from the registrar uh, to apply. If you have any questions about the clinic, I think my email is listed in, on the slides, maybe at the end of the slides. Yeah, for sure. And so I would be delighted to um, to communicate with you through email, or please just come down to the Silver Mint Basement Clinic and come say hi. I'd love to meet you. And we'll take Q&A at the end, if you don't Oh, mind. excellent. So for those of you who don't know, uh, part of graduation requirement and for sitting for some bars has an experiential learning requirement, <coughs> which this satisfies. And it becomes absolutely critical. And what you'll learn for those of us who actually went to education, and I, I actually, among my, my first job out of college was I taught high school. And uh, I learned a certain amount of education theory. And what you learn is there is a mode of learning, which is experiential learning, which is, you know, there's oral, visual, all these other collaborative. And there's nothing quite like representing a client. I mean, it's, we talk about it very abstract, but there's nothing like representing the clients. And the clients are great. Okay. Tell, can you, you want to talk a little bit about the clients? Sure. Uh, I can. Um, so I mentioned the categories that they come in, but maybe I can give you just a couple of examples. Um, we've, and, and Ange can speak to this too. I'm going to introduce Ange in a second for a different reason, but she does uh, at the clinic. But we have represented... Um, this semester, we have a, a, a nonprofit that is developing digital content in Creole for children in Haiti that don't have access uh, to traditional education. Um, and so that has all kinds of copyright implications. Uh, we also, uh, on the patent side, we're representing a really sophisticated technology that is an imaging technology that helps uh, doctors to see the um, effectiveness of treatment on tumors and it will integrate with mRNA which is a lot in the news um, these days because of the Moderna vaccine and Pfizer vaccine so we're representing uh, we're doing a project with them to see basically how they can productize this technology without infringing others patents um, we've represented independent filmmakers we have represented all kinds of nonprofits we have another uh, client this semester that's uh, welcoming immigrants to Philadelphia, and they would like to look at how they can uh, protect their curriculum and license it around the nation to other sorts of, of nonprofits that are doing similar work. That's just three off the top of my head, but we have fabulous clients that are doing really important work, and you can be part of, of helping them to do their work by, by counseling them. Well, I know you could, and I could talk about this clinic all day, but in the, in out of, uh, because we have so much other things to talk about, we'll keep moving on. There are other classes that are quite distinctive. Um, Professor Wagner teaches the patent law class as a flipped class. So you see the lectures outside of class and spend all the time doing exercises inside. Uh, in many ways, many of us, I know he thinks it's the future of education. Um, he teaches the moot court as his seminar. And so he actually works very deeply with students. We've actually won the national title, I don't know, at least three times in the last 10 years. Uh, he it's, a, a, it's a labor of love for him. A lot of other moot courts have opportunities. For those of you who are LLM, there is an IP and technology law concentration. 
Patent litigation is taught by Kent Jordan. He's a Third Circuit judge who was a District Court of Delaware judge. And for those of you who don't understand how this works, the average district court judge in Delaware has about 200 to 250 patent cases at any time. And certain venues in the country have become the place to do patent law. And he continues to sit by designation on the district court, taking on additional cases too, because he's so interested and engaged in patent law. And um, he actually is a great litigator. He came out of the US Attorney's Office there too. And we're very lucky to have that relationship. A whole bunch of elections I've shown you before. But these are really, that class is taught as a, an advanced elective, it's kept small intentionally, required to have patent law to go with, and to really, um, and with some simulations, not just more, okay, here's a bunch of stuff like me doing what I'm doing right now, talking to you in front of the classroom, to actually get engaged in things in a very different way. And we're actually trying to develop classes that in a young clinic, because not every student can take that, that actually bring in some of that to the classroom in other ways, all right? In addition to true classes, there are a number of what we call credit-bearing supervised programs uh, there's four of them that are listed here, and uh, who is the right person to talk about Law Without Walls? I don't even know. I can. Cindy. Cindy. So Cindy, you are, why don't you talk about line, Law Without Walls, Iron Tech Lawyer, and Kiretsu Forum, because you are the maven of all three of those things. Sure. 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 And, sure. and then I'll people and we have, talk yes. about people, yeah. actually. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about people. Okay, so really briefly, and again, uh, please reach out to me if you're interested in any of these um, programs. But we have a, a bunch of uh, interesting things you can get, uh, projects that you can get involved in that are either structured as, uh, what do we have here? These are all independent studies. We also have externships we're going to talk about in just a moment. Um, Law Without Walls is, a, uh, is an international simulation um, where you, you gather with uh, teams from around the world. Um, hopefully in future semesters it will be in person. Uh, the last one was in Spain, but then we've been virtual for two years. Um, where you basically try to solve legal problems with tech solutions. And they like the interdisciplinary nature of bringing together lawyers and engineers and business people to all be thinking about these issues similar to Iron Tech Lawyer, but that's our for real um, solution. We partner with a nonprofit locally uh, to, to, uh, to answer their legal questions with uh, tech solutions. And the way that I run it is, is also to partner students across schools in, at Penn to, uh, to make a team to, uh, to all contribute to this solution, and then you pitch it, it's a competition. The Kretzu Forum is an opportunity that um, is again local, but if you're interested in early stage entrepreneurship and in, in funding such entrepreneurship, you can serve on a due diligence team to help Kuretsu Forum figure out which uh, ventures to invest in. You basically attend those investor meetings, you meet with me every other week, we talk about what you've seen, and then you operate as a member of that due diligence team to try to see if these investments are sound. And then I'd like to um, introduce Ange Cristiani, who's going to tell you a bit more about another program we have going here. I'm going to hold this. It seems like it'll be easier. So hi, everybody. I'm Ange Cristiani. Um, I can fully support almost all of the programs that have been introduced to you today, having participated in almost every single one of them. Like Professor Dahl said, I took the IP clinic. It was hands down one of the best experiences I've had in law school, and I doubt that it will be surpassed. It's a wonderful learning experience, and it's a positive personal growth experience. If you're interested at all, consider taking it. But I'm here to talk to you about People, which is a unique program that Penn has. And from my research, no other university or law school has something like it. So what we do is students from the law school partner with senior engineering groups at the undergraduate school, and we discuss with them projects that they're working on involving technology or new IP. And we basically do a baby clinic. We talk to these engineering students, we learn about the tech, we learn about their business model, and then we simulate counseling as their in-house legal counsel telling them, here's what I see as a potential IP issue. Have you considered licensing this tech? Have you considered where your business model is going to go? Who do you want to contract with and how do you want to contract with them? We talk to them about liability concerns and opening themselves up to lawsuits, 
perhaps they want to minimize that uh, exposure. So this is a great program to get into if you're thinking you're not sure you want to do a clinic. This would be a great first step to see if you like that client engagement in a very low risk environment. The best thing about people is it's one credit every semester for four semesters should you choose to engage in it as an upperclassman. This year we've changed the program a little bit and I'm allowing 1Ls to come and shadow to see what we do, not for credit, just come if you like the idea, if you think several people in the audience, yes, are participating in this. Um, if you're interested, reach out to me, we'd love to have you. And we're also thinking about engaging in a separate portion where you don't participate as a class. We're looking to grow it to be more of a social engagement and club on the outside. So come talk to me. I can talk to you about anything that we've talked about so far and about people. We'd love to have you. Fantastic. Thank you. And Angie's email address is also okay. yep. on the slide, which I can. As it will be on the last slide of every student, every person who will speak to you today. So um, don't worry, we'll get that to you. Uh, so beyond that, we also support pub, uh, the CTIC actually funds public interest fellowships. So not just during the class, but next coming this summer. Uh, we have funded every year for the last several years two, between two and four student public interest fellowships. Uh, and so including this, Gerald. Including Gerald at the Federal Communications Institute. Uh, this is an a, a representative list of the kind of places where people have worked. Um, uh, it is not all of them, uh, but by, it's one of those things where we've actually also helped people uh, find the positions because one of these things like, you know, um, at a minimum, we can connect you to the students who did it before because um, I actually have ties to the DOJ and the Justice Division, for example, but I don't actually know who to contact about the process of getting an internship. But one way or the other, we, I have given ideas, I've actually given contacts, it's just a matter of making that work. Obviously on that, there's no guarantees, and if you're interested in something that I just don't know that many people in, it's just not gonna happen, but a lot of, it's something we're willing to support. I mean, and as much as possible to take advantage of that. Yes. And I think this uh, has been Professor great. Dahl actually, uh, placed Richard Hildreth, yeah. uh, former president of PIPG at Wistar, yeah, which, several summers ago. Which is a cancer research institute or beyond that? Uh, yes. Here yeah, on yeah, campus. Yes. It start, anyway, and if that's interesting, that's actually even available, as we'll talk about um, during the semester in two slides. So in addition, we actually have a number of relationships with companies. We, have, we tie in with people who, these are places that some of our, stu some of our students have worked in the last several years. Um, by all, we are keeping a database of contact information so you know who, which, who to contact. Often that's all you really need. And in addition, we have a relationship with certain employers right now, with, certainly with AT&T, and I'm in discussions with Facebook, who actually want us to set up a more formal relationship referring them students. <coughs> if you're interested in doing this on the, that side, you can also work for a firm. I actually, if you ask me, if I had a choice, in a, particularly in a 1L summer, between working for a law firm or one of their clients, <coughs> The law firms who are interviewing you in the fall of your second year are going to be much more interested in you for your experience with a client because they're not the people they're sucking up to as opposed to working with another lawyer, which is a fairly interesting experience. Not everyone will agree with that, get a lot of advice on things like that. But you know, I think that's a pretty neat opportunity. And we've had a lot of luck. We have, again have a lot of relationships that we can try to support you with in this. Semester long opportunities, in addition to individual classes, there are a number of relationships we have. The, you know, we, the Tsinghua University is one of our exchange programs. Uh, it's very rarely done, but they actually have an intellectual property program taught at the graduate level in English. So if, you're, if you think that uh, Chinese IP law is the future, as many people do, um, that's a new opportunity. Penn Center for Innovation, again, Professor Dahl is the primary contact. That is our tech transfer office. Uh, we have sponsored uh, interns there for a semester, as with Wistar. Uh, the Internet Society is an organization with which um, I have personal ties. They have headquarters in Reston, but also offices in Geneva. They've been asking for people. And if it's like this on an ad hoc externship, there's some, it can be done. There's a bunch of hoops you have to jump through to be able to be in residence there for the entire semester. And frankly, uh, in this day and age, I think uh, the one experience the thing that COVID has succeeded in doing has made us much more tolerant of hybrid situations, so I could see something happening where you could arrange to do this during the semester by not being fully in residence, but doing it periodically because we just had to learn the hard way how to do all this. EFF has been asking for us to send someone to Northern California for years, we've never quite done it, ACLU Northern California, and there's some other things as well. So these are opportunities which do require a fair amount of initiative on the part of the student to pull it together. 
but they are open to you. So if it's something you're interested in pursuing uh, and we'll figure out the timing, we're happy to support it and happy to encourage you to do that. Uh, let's see, where am I? Student organizations. One of the other things that I, I'm very proud of is the ties that we have in this space between the faculty and the student organizations. But rather than hear me say that, it makes more sense to have you hear from them directly about um, what they're doing and other connections with the overall community. So let's start with, since PIPG is at the top, Nicole, are you going to talk about it? Sure. And Gerald, you don't need to talk twice, do you? No, I won't do that to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> it's easier for me to just hold this. So yeah, hi, fine. everyone. Um, I'm Nicole Hobatter. Um, I'm the membership chair for uh, PIPG, and we are exactly what we sound like, the student group uh, related to intellectual property. Uh, so this means we have students uh, interested in the whole host of IP products, um, copyright, patent, trademarks, trade names, uh, and because of our uh, diverse interests, we try and hold uh, diverse events throughout the year um, to cater to the interests of our entire membership. Uh, so those include, uh, we have trainings that will hopefully be relevant uh, to IP practice, if that's something that you're interested in. Um, we also hear from speakers, and uh, we have really great networking events uh, within the IP community throughout the year as well. Uh, the largest event is the symposium, which is in the spring, uh, which is dedicated to a different topic each year where we have speakers who are experts on our topic come um, to, you know, to speak with our students and also to provide opportunity for discussion. The symposium topic for this year is still TBD, but we've had really great um, and interesting symposium topics in the past. Uh, we had a symposium on, I think, the intersection of AI and IP, one dedicated to innovation, um, we have one dedicated to media and its impact on IP, so very uh, broad uh, topics that will hopefully you know, cater to a wide variety of interests. Um, so if this is something you're interested in, you know, we've really encourage you to get involved. Um, my 1L year, it was a great precursor to the IP elective in the spring. Um, it also just kind of introduces you to the general community and provides an opportunity for networking. Our 1L and LLM uh, representative applications are open. Gerald sent them out, so if you didn't get them, let one of us know. I think they're due October 8th, which I think is next Friday. Um, and uh, those opportunities for involvement really pertain to social media, the group runs its own blog, um, planning events throughout the year, and then also planning the symposium, again, our largest event. So if, uh, you know, we hope to hear, uh, to hear from you and to meet you and interact with you all. Terrific. Uh, fantastic organization. We're lucky to have it. Niall, Penn Law Sam. It's the Penn Law STEM Club. I always thought it was the Penn Law STEM Club. <laughs> so uh, my name is Niall Delso. I'm a second year student, uh, and I'm on the board of the STEM Club. The STEM Club is really nice because it is a very relaxed, a very informal, um, professional and academic uh, sort of mentorship resource group. Um, so I think what the, the strongest part of our group is, is really the, the big network of students that we have. I mean, we've been talking a lot about all of these different opportunities, and I know that when I was starting my first year, it was sort of intimidating how anybody does one of these, let alone four or five of them. Um, but the truth is that it, it really is possible. These are all awesome opportunities, and a lot of people have done these things, and, and that's sort of the, the network that we like to promote. So throughout the year, we have a lot of really um, informal, small um, setting um, events throughout the year. I think early in the fall, they'll sort of relate more to your classes. Um, I think we, we want to have an, an outlining and, and sort of a, a how-to 1L session early on, just recognizing this is a, a career change for um, a lot of people. Um, and then sort of in the winter, as you look to maybe your first year um, summer job opportunity, um, you can look to our alumni and, and see what they've done in the past and, and we'll definitely um, coordinate some conversations um, amongst the group about um, opportunities available to you. And, and then obviously not something you should be thinking about right now, but, but what you're going to do in, in your second year and even going beyond. So. Like I said, our, our strong point is really the, the network of, of alumni that, that we have. Um, and I think we, we also have a, a 1L uh, app open as well, but, but again, it's, it's a very low commitment, informal 
um, club, and, and it's really just a, an opportunity for um, the, the community to come together. And I think, like Professor Yu has talked about throughout, that, that's really something that we emphasize is, is the, the community and, and leaning on each other um, as you make your way through Penn. Thank you. So it's fascinating to me, the existence of the Penn Law STEM Club actually answers a question I get a lot, which is, do you have to have a STEM background to do IP? The answer is actually no. Because if the answer were yes, there would be no Penn Law STEM Club and a PIPG, they'd be the same organization, because it'd be part of the identity. What we do find, though, is there's a separation. One, there are plenty of STEM students, non-STEM students who do IP. The flip side is, there are plenty of STEM students who don't do, IP, don't, don't do it the other way around. And what I've become aware of is it's an interesting, I think of it more as, a, as much as an affinity, because STEM students experience law school in a very different way. It's like, uh, you have to read 25 pages per class per day. It's like, what? That's not something, st you know, you're going to get a grade at the end, there's no problem sets, you know, and the idea, you're going to have to write papers on the 25, you know, this stuff is very alien to many students. And it's, in some ways, it's, uh, it's just a different set of expectations. And so to me, They've been a great resource for those students. If that's your background, I encourage you to talk to them. Uh, we, there's some really neat opportunities we have that are distinctively about appropriate for STEM students, and we communicate them with Niall all the time, and it's just been a, a wonderful collaboration. And it goes to show that we're in multiple overlapping communities. Not all of us will fit into all of them, but the point is, at the same token, we're enriched by having different ones with slightly different focuses, so they actually match it with what you need and what you're interested in. All right. Vivian, uh, Penn Law, one of our newest associations, uh, student organizations in the space, is the Penn Law Antitrust Association. And if you would. Hello, everybody. I'm Vivian. I'm an LLM student from Brazil. And as Professor Yu has said, this is one of the newest student group in Penn. It was honored this year, and the idea is to discuss like, the hot topics and the current discussions with antitrust. So, as you may have seen, we have several discussions regarding Google, Amazon. At games, all these kind of related IP discussions. So that's why so far our group is more focused on in the digital and digital sector, uh, sector and also the big techs and discussion with related to antitrust. So just to give you some examples with what we have done and we, what we want to do in the future. So the first semester we hosted a panel with the head of regulatory office from Uber in Brazil, and he came to Penn by Zoom. Doing like, and he did a speech on how was the, all these big platforms, especially Uber, was dealing with all the antitrust challenges, and also how it relates with like, like data privacy and intellectual property issues. And in October, just already advertising our, our seminar, in October 29, we're going to host the first international conference related to antitrust, and the main focus will be like, the driven of the event will be related to digital platforms. So, just to give you some insights, what we're going to like we're gonna have one of the panels we're gonna invite several antitrust authorities so to idea to give how the antitrust agencies are dealing with digital markets for instance all these kind of investigation with big platforms and also clear acquisitions that you see a clear acquisition when you buy one company just excluding the market and not to compete another panel we're gonna invite from a uh, private sector to talk about unilateral conducts related to the cases they work and another one related, related with blockchain, artificial intelligence, and antitrust. We have the presence of Professor Yu and also Giovanna over there. They will be the speakers in addition to Professor Chimbo from Stanford also. And so it will be a very good opportunity and to, for you all to attend and to join here. So just to analyze here, just to conclude, to, to our final comments. So we, uh, since we are very a new group here, we are really open to LLMs, 1L, 2L, 3Ls to join us and open to discuss and to shape and build this, this organization. And also since we have many LLM students involved in this group, like from Colombia, Brazil, India, Greece, uh, China, this is like a great opportunity also so you, for you to connect with people that already work and study from different countries. So you can see from different perspectives about how the other uh, jurisdictions is dealing with regarding antitrust and IP law discussions. So welcome all, and feel free to contact if you have any questions or not. Sure, thank you. And, and logo pending. Yes, and we are working on <laughs> <the> logo. <laughs> We're sticking for the school approval, so pretty soon we'll have a logo as well. Next year. So um, just so you know, it's interesting. Uh, when 
I got, my best friend from high school wanted to be an antitrust lawyer and didn't do it because antitrust was dead. And Josh Wright, uh, who has just stepped out as an FTC commissioner not that long ago, wrote in a blog, he's an antitrust professor, he said, what happened? It used to be one of those vital dynamic areas of the law. And if you'd asked me even 10 years ago for advice, whether to do it, I'd say, don't do it. That advice is obviously no longer true. But competition's in the name of the center for a reason. Well, that's, yeah, it's a, a personal interest of mine, but it's one of those things where it just goes to show if you stand still long enough, you know, all this 70 stuff has gotten cool again, and you know, I'm old and this is all coming back around. But the point I would make is, in addition, this is an astonishingly good place to do this. Herb Huffenkamp is the world's leading authority on antitrust, sort of bar none. Aviv Nevo is a former head of the antitrust, the chief economist, he's in economics, and Wharton, and we're building ties. Uh, there's a university professor who's called a Penn Integrates Knowledge Professor, a name of Keshe Four, who's jointly appointed in economics and engineering. And we're all working together to really get this interdisciplinary idea to think that you can't just study it from one perspective. And, and we're actually working on a foundation on a grant called the Economics of Digital Services. So, I mean, there's a lot of interesting things going on there, too, in a way that wasn't true in the past. All right? That's our organizations. I'm sure there's more we could say, and I'm sure that there's other ones we have relationships with that we're working on that are less, but we'll let it go with that and uh, move on to this. Uh, we actually do a number of programs oriented to students on a monthly basis. And so one is uh, what I think of as a CLE program that is hot topics, you know, what's going on uh, in here. We're going to do our first one. It's coming up on September 29th. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. That would be tomorrow. Uh, and uh, we'll, it's usually our preview of the year, looking forward across. There's four different people talking about very, very different things. And I'll talk about them when we get to that slide at the end. And you can see these are the kinds of things we've done in the past. You can see this, they cover the gamut. And we already have at least one uh, plan in November on the healthcare space, which I'll show you as well. In addition, at noon, keep your eyes open. And I'll also talk about the first one of these is coming up. We will do a monthly career series. So um, as much as I love contracts, torts, and civil procedure, they don't actually give you much of an idea of what it means to practice in these spaces. And so I remember when I got to my end of my first year, I realized that I didn't know anything and I didn't know how to think about this. Uh, and so autobiographically, I'm determined not to let that happen to you. And so one of the things we're going to do is bring in a disparate set of speakers. Our first one's a patent litigator. We'll bring in people from all different parts of the tech industry, firms, companies, government, private interest, you know, privacy, antitrust, venture capital, everything in between, just to give you as broad a sense as possible. We, bring, we change them every year. So even if you've been last year, you'll can you see more. I uh, encourage you to come to that. We mentioned the Journal Symposium and the PIPG Symposium, which we also support, and in addition to other events. There's a lot, and specifically these are the events. Um, we are co-sponsoring with the Federal Society an event on state efforts to regulate social media, publishers, or common carriers, uh, which is coming up at noon tomorrow, in person, in FITS. Uh, tomorrow night or evening, late afternoon at 4.30, we're doing our first uh, you know, emerging issues event online, so you don't actually have to be here, and so uh, if that makes it easier, uh, Professor Allen is gonna, has a new paper coming out in the Yale Law Journal on platform governance and the role of privacy. Professor Huffenkamp is going to talk about all the hot new issues going on in antitrust. Um, Gideon Parchamovsky is going to talk about Google versus Oracle, which is the most important copyright case for in years, and Professor... Um, Rothman just emailed us and said something, she was going to talk about something else, but she just said there's something that's brand new and hot, and I can't even remember what it is. The state of Michael Jackson. Uh, no, it's not. She changed. Oh. I have not so read that. So uh, for those of you who don't know, she, one of her interests is, among other things, is what's called name image likeness stuff, which is very hot right now, and there's a big fight over Michael Jackson's estate about how to value that. And the IRS just got its ass kicked. And so it's one of these interesting <laughs> things that's, yeah. I mean, there's no words about it. Um, we are first, okay. We're going to do that, and you'll see on a monthly basis, as I mentioned on the last one here, the book talk on November 15th is another one of these in the healthcare space about uh, choose your medicine, freedom of therapeutic choice. And we, our first uh, career speaker is on the books for October 14th at noon. All will be virtual because she's out in California, and that seems to be the best way to do it. Uh, she's actually a patent litigator, the head, the chief legal officer of Patrick. So... Uh, it's, uh, we'll do that on a regular basis, and if you get on our mailing list, we'll make sure, actually those will be pushed they, out to the all students. all of it, yeah. Anyway. So, but we also do have a mailing list, so if you want to see, we put out, particularly every, at the beginning of every month, we list all the things we're doing, all the speeches given by our faculty, new publications, other things like that, and opportunities come okay. up Now for, I've been talking about things the typical JD student will do, and a lot of opportunities. If you're really way into this, there's a really unique set of opportunities that we've created here. 
that allow you to engage in a very, very major sort of way. So um, we have students who are simultaneously getting masters from the MBBs from the engineering school while they're getting their JD. And if you're interested in this, uh, there is a particular program and a contact we'll give you who is Amanda Marinoff, who's in charge of doing all this. Um, it's not, I, I wouldn't say a large number of people do this, but for the people who do it, it actually can completely rechange their lives. Um, there's one of our students who's actually openly said he was a political science and a Latin major in college, and this basically changed the trajectory of his entire career. I have another student who's uh, here, she's an English major, and um, it's terrifying, by the way, by the way, because there are actually wrong answers on science things in ways that are really true in, in law, but um, it's very, very tough. Uh, based on how we're doing on time, well, do you think we do it or not? No. Uh, I will leave the link up there. There is a two-minute video of two of our students, so if you're interested when we distribute these slides, you can look at that to give you just a taste of what that's like. Uh, there is a certificate in engineering entrepreneurship that's a much heavier, lighter lift than uh, basically what amounts to about a year extra of classes. It can be done usually in the content. You have to understand, Penn is really unique in encouraging you and making it easier for you to take schools, classes outside the school. Uh, by the way, it costs us lots of money because tuition moves with your classes and your tuition is higher than the engineering tuition. And so this is generally something that most schools discourage, hide, and actually make as hard as possible because of our commitment to interdisciplinary work in education. We are strongly encouraging you to do this and take full advantage of it. And I would say that the engineering entrepreneurship program is one of those. And we have scholarships that support the joint degree students. So if this is something you're interested in, I encourage you to talk to us. It doesn't mean you have to take the GRE and a whole bunch of other things, but it's just, you know, it's how it is. Um, we are, I'm gonna spend the least time talking about this, but just to throw it up there, all faculty are involved in research, and there are opportunities to get involved in it. It's not, um, it, you know, I, it has to be a fit. Uh, there was a time I needed a person who spoke French. You know, it didn't matter what, how great you were. If there was a particular need, it just made sense of something you're going to do. But um, different faculty are working on different things. Um, I'm trying to, I'm doing studies on how to connect more people to the internet. Half the world isn't, seven billion people aren't law online. As I mentioned, uh, economics and digital services, antitrust is hot, algorithmic uh, discrimination, internet routing security. Uh, two of our faculty are doing work on empirical patent law, private law theory, publicity, trademarks, you name it, privacy. Um, and what I would encourage you to do is to think about this as a great opportunity, either uh, this summer, as an independent researcher writing, supervising a note and comment in a journal, um, taking seminars, all these sorts of things to get to know people. And lastly, we, order, we do organize on the faculty level purely scholarly events. Uh, many of these are not open to the public even. They're sort of closed workshops that are, exist. Uh, we do them in computer science, copyright. We have a global patent law conference in Japan every year. Uh, we do, we're actually, uh, one, along with Stanford and Northwestern on a rotating basis, host the Junior Faculty Forum for Law STEM Scholars, where we're hosting actually on the 15th and 16th of October. Um, as I mentioned, economics and digital services, competition law, and we're starting a new trademark scholarship round two, uh, because uh, largely driven by the interest of faculty. That's it. Substantively, here is the contact information for everyone who's spoken, and including Amanda Aronoff, who wanted to be here but had to, could not. We have about five minutes for the hour. Questions? Did I forget anybody? No. Oh. Angie's not. I'll have to add. I'll add. Sorry. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Personally. We can fix that. I didn't make the cut. I'm, I'm personally well, offended. Well, you, well, are, you know? Listen, and you set yourself apart, man. You really, you <laughs> nailed it up there. Mm -hmm. Uh... Yes. yes. My interest is like internet content moderation, social media. Are there any professors or programs uh, working on that? So we'll talk about this some of the internet law. There's a whole class on social media law that looks specifically about it. And the other obvious thing is the First Amendment. This is very different in the US than it is everywhere else. I actually just wrote a piece, what was it? It's on the Journal of Free Speech Law. That's to show how much I can remember. It's uh, sort of something, common cares and public accommodations. The role for, I can't remember. Well, the, the, the event tomorrow is about. The event tomorrow is about this. Um, uh, Richard Epstein is a libertarian scholar, and he speaks so fast. It's pretty amazing. He's, if nothing else, for the fear of watching him talk, is pretty high. But um, he's, you know, if you, he has a very, very distinctive perspective on this stuff. And I, if you are working in the US, it's something you have to come to grips with, because it's very different here than it is everywhere else. 
Um, she's debating Amanda Shaner, who's um, Wharton has a legal studies department, which is a bunch of law professors teaching undergrads, which I never quite understood, but there it is. And she, it's an interest of hers, and she's interested in First Amendment stuff as well. Um, and I'm sure there's other opportunities, but it's one of those things where it's just a matter of finding the right fit for someone. You know, Seth Kramer has talked about internet intermediation. He teaches the class in First Amendment in the 21st century with a distinctive spin. And it's just a matter of uh, figuring out how that goes. Yeah? I have a question about the Deaf King Clinic. Am I correct in having read that there's also an, an advanced IP clinic? If so, how does that work? Oh, so um, you work with me for a second semester just on client work. So I should have probably specified that the Deckman Clinic is both a seminar and the client work. So it's seven credits. And what you're learning in seminar is it's skill building, uh, substantive law, case rounds. Basically, it supports your client work. If you've already been through that, um, then you can just sign up to do additional client work. Sometimes you're carrying your client over to another semester. Sometimes you're getting an additional experience. But it's just uh, uh, another credit-bearing uh, second semester of clinic that you do with me. Great, thank you. Please. Um, I'd love to learn more about the semester long opportunities with a variety of organizations like the ACLU, EFF. Are those taking place, or do they replace your classes? So are you graduating a semester later? Is it remote, in person, and what is the process to get involved? So, to be full disclosure, I've developed this opportunity with students, but no one's ever pulled the trigger. Okay, so it, the, the, the vision inherent in this is you spend a semester in residence in the place you're going. And to do that, you have to take a certain number of independent studies, but there's a cap on the number of those. You probably have to do an externship experiential thing as an ad hoc externship, because the standing ones that you have every year don't have to get approved, but there's a it's not hard, it's just hoops. And you have to cobble together, sort of, if you will, this very distinctive set of four classes that allows you to do it remotely and without, um, but still be a full-time student. And it's actually, I've never done the exercise now, it's got to be easier now. Because our willingness to entertain possibilities, both as a regulatory matter from the ABA, but also as a curricular matter, has got to be much, much looser. And so um, it's been amazing. Um, for teachers of all kinds, whether it's from kindergarten up to where we are, are not the most innovative group all the time. And this has really forced us to try new things. This has been kind of fun. Um, that's something we should have a specific conversation about to figure out how to do it. Yeah, please. Um, so I noticed that the student organizations, I feel like, have a specific area that they're targeting. What if you have, like, no idea which one you want to do? I guess, like, what is the approach there? Well, I'm sure some of them, some of you have no idea what you wanted to do. How do you handle this? How do you navigate this? Well, the nice thing about student groups is, yes, we do have focus areas, but it's still broad and casual enough that... We have plenty of people, so PIPG for instance, we have plenty of people in PIPG that don't necessarily know or want to be patent lawyers. They're just trying to get exposure to the content. Given how limited the commitment is, right, it's not a huge barrier or burden to students. I really recommend at least joining multiple clubs to see what it's like. No one's going to hold it against you if you decide it's not for you. Um, and then additionally, JLI provides a wonderful experience in the journal where it really is broad within the purview of technology, but that's kind of full stop where it ends.